that you would uh, reach down into their hearts and their lives. Lord, the seed's been planted with Glenn, and we pray that that begins to be watered and it begins to grow, Lord, and it would uh, flourish into uh, truly a saved man, a saved heart. Lord, we pray for Devin as well, that the same thing would happen within his life. And Lord, the, those folks in, in England, we just uh, appreciate, Lord, the work that's going on there, Lord, their diligent efforts. We thank you for Demi, Lord, that we've prayed for her, Lord, as a church here. I know Wednesday night we have. And Lord, you've honored and you've answered that prayer. And she came, Lord, this last week to salvation in you. What a great thing. We praise and we give you glory for that, too, that that work's been done in her heart. Lord, just like Brother Kurt said, too, there's a, there's a field out here. Many of us are working with those people, Lord, and we've been working with them for, for many months, maybe years, Lord. And, and we know some people come along slowly, but we, we would ask that you would bring those seeds to growth in their lives, too, Lord. Those families that we're reaching out to, Lord, that we can implant them in a local body, a local church, Lord, where they can grow. We just lift them before you too, Lord, and just guide and lead, Lord, as we come to your word tonight. Uh, we want your uh, spirit to speak, not man, Lord, here, but the spirit of God. We just ask this in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. Well, I don't really know where to begin. <laughs> there's, there's so much, and uh, I think uh, maybe the Lord is is pointing me just to a couple uh, passages, one from Second uh, Peter, kind of from an, for an opening. We are looking at uh, Balaam from the book of Jude, and uh, how there we have the way of Balaam, we have the doctrine of Balaam, and then we have the heir of Balaam. This morning we did look at uh, the way of Balaam, and that's really what we see in Second Peter 2.15. So I want to just start by reading that to us. I didn't share that from this morning. 2 Peter 2, 15 says this, Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bazor, or Beor we've seen in the Old Testament, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his inequity, the dumbass, speaking with a man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. That's exactly what we had looked at this morning, wasn't it? Uh, the ass or the donkey uh, that he was on and, and riding there. And then as we look in the, the Revelation, we see the beginning of the doctrine of Balaam. Revelation chapter 2, something that we're going to be getting to on Wednesday night pretty shortly. Verse 14 says, this is the message under the church of Pergamos here. He says, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them, them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat sacrifices unto idols and to commit fornication. So it's marvelous how... Again, when we look at the whole of God's Word, we get pieces, even in the New Testament, that weren't shared in the fullness in the Old Testament, but to put the picture together for us. And we are looking at the apostate, and we're looking at the example of Balaam being an apostate person. Uh, we looked at that way this morning, and really I think the focus of how he was not a godly man. He was a diviner, the divination, a witchcraft. He was an enchanter. He was conjuring up familiar spirits. And that's what he was about when the God of Israel made himself known unto Balaam. So, we looked at his way. The way of Balaam was in God's directive will. God told him something to do, but God gave permissive will. And in the permissive will, Balaam did not follow what the Lord had wanted. Even though, as we read what we read this morning, it kind of looked like that. And I shared that that's exactly how the apostate is. It looks good, but really when you get to it, it isn't good. It's a deception or a delusion. 
And if you go and, and, and you open the numbers again, I've got this, this fly that's kind of <laughs> it's buzzing around here. <laughs> um, so I might start swatting. Um, I think we ended right about verse uh, 39 of chapter 22. So we're going to pick up there. And we're going to begin to look at this doctrine of Balaam. In the doctrine of Balaam, we're going to see three prophecies that Balaam gives, that God gives him directly. So, we're going to start verse 40. He says, And Balak offered oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into a high place of Baal that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. Where does Balak take him but to a high place of Baal? And we know Baal is a false god, isn't he? One of the false gods of the Moabite people, or the Midianite people. Here he takes him up there to this place, and he shows him, he shows him Israel, but he only shows him the utmost part, which is a fourth part. That means he just shows him just a little bit of Israel and who they are. In verse chapter 23, we go on in verse 1. It says, And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by thy burnt offering, and I will go peradventure. The Lord will come to meet me, and whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And he went to an high place. And he went to a high, a high place. Well, what was the high place? That was idolatrous worship, wasn't it? That's exactly where he goes, the enchanter, the diviner, right? He was popular. People were looking at bringing him in because he, those he cursed and those he blessed, it came to pass. Here he goes to a high place. We know that his intention is not to speak with the God of Israel, but it's the familiar spirit. But the God of Israel meets him there and does end up speaking to him. You notice that we said that we were going to see more and more of Balaam's heart. They got seven, seven altars, and they prepare seven oxen and seven rams to begin to sacrifice on the altars. Do you know that the book right before this in Leviticus, do you know where it said Israel was to offer their sacrifices? At the temple. There was no other place to offer the sacrifice but at the tabernacle. I want to read that here. Uh, it's in actually Leviticus 17, so it's not too far back from where we are. Leviticus 17, verse 8 says, And thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offer a burnt offering or sacrifice, and bring it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. There was one place of sacrifice. If he truly was a believer, if he truly was following the God of Israel, where would have he sacrificed? He would have been in the camp of Israel, sacrificing there. But he goes here with Balak to the high place. False worship. But while he's there, verse 4, God met Balaam. This is the God of Israel. Met Balaam. And he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus thou shalt speak. And just notice some of the things that the Lord puts in his heart. He puts in his mouth to speak. And he, and he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable and said, Balak the king of Moab hath brought me from Aram 
out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. And Balak said unto Balaam, What hast thou done unto me? I took thee to curse my enemies. And behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? See, it even sounds good still, doesn't it? The God of Israel put this in his heart, his mind, his, his mouth, what he spoke. But I don't think it was truly what Balaam wanted to speak. See, I think truly in his heart, he did want to curse Israel. He did. I think we'll see a little bit of that later. He wanted to curse Israel. But God puts it in his mouth that he speaks blessing. God can do that. He can take an unsaved man and he can make him speak. He took a donkey and made him speak. The God of Israel can take the mouth and he can make one speak. He can. So Balaam speaks that which the Lord God wants him to speak. But he still thinks... He's conjuring up the diviners, isn't he? This familiar spirit. So what spirit is it? What God is it? Baal that's speaking to me? Who is it for sure? Well, he goes on in verse 13 and says, And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee with me. See, that was the first prophecy. Here we're going to move into the second one. I pray thee with me. I pray thee with me unto another place from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them and shall not see them all, and curse me them from, hit, from thence. And he brought him into the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah. And he built seven altars, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And he said unto Balak, Stand here by thy burnt offering, while I meet the Lord yonder. While I meet the Lord yonder. Where, where was he? He's going to go to a high place again, wasn't he? I'm going to go meet the Lord yonder. You stay here. We're going to offer the same sacrifices again at a place where God says, you shouldn't offer sacrifices. Only one place must we offer sacrifices. And the Lord met with Balaam and put a word in his mouth again and said, go again unto Balak and say thus. And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, what hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. Hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and what he not do it? And he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the, and the shout of the king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn, or it could be an ox. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. He's speaking to him. You can't enchant against the God of Israel. You can't divine against him. He's the true God here. This is what he's speaking to him. This is the words that God gave him. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them. See, no, 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 don't, don't curse them, but don't do either of it. Don't bless them and don't curse them. Just don't listen to what he's telling you to do anymore. Don't, don't do either thing here. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh, that must I do. And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee to another place. Peradventure it will 
Please, God, that thou mayest curse me them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor, that looketh toward Jeshimon, which means wasteland. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven bullocks and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, and he offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. I, what does that mean, right? I'm not going to go to that high place. He's been fighting against God. He has. You know, his spirit, he hasn't wanted to bless him. But God's made him bless him. He's been in this war, in this fight, hasn't he? As, as he went on the path with his donkey. The Lord would have slain him if it hadn't been for that donkey. He would have slain him right there. Right? His way was perverse before the Lord. He's offering where he shouldn't offer. He's a diviner. He's an enchanter. He's a witchcrafter. We can get a whole bunch of other names to it. But here, I think he's gone in. I think God's gone in for the knockout. He has. I, th I think he's, he's given him the blow, hasn't he? He's knocked him down a couple spots, hasn't he? Oh, I can't go to that place anymore. I'm not going to go there because of the God of Israel has got me. He's been revealing himself to him. He's been KO'd. He has. He's down for the count. One, two, three. He's down for the count. Look what he's... And Balaam saw... It pleased the Lord to bless Israel. He went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. There was an awakening a little bit, a little bit for a moment, for a moment. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. See the first part he'd only seen. I think the first, the first little bit. A fourth part of Israel. God opens his eyes. He goes to the wilderness. He sees the whole encampment of God. What that would have been to see Israel. And them coming up into your land. And all that you've heard about them. Oh, there was fear. I think there would have been fear in my heart. I would have been scared. I, Balak was scared. Wasn't he? He was. That's why he calls for Balaam, that popular diviner, to come and help me. Help me with this. Oh, but notice, the Spirit came upon That doesn't mean he's saved here. The Spirit came upon him. The Spirit can come upon a man on the outside and direct or show you truth without you being saved. The Holy Spirit comes out and convicts a man or a woman of their need for the Savior. The same thing. The Spirit came upon him, not in him. The same thing I think happened to King Saul. I don't believe King Saul for a minute was saved. But as you read the Bible, it kind of sounds like maybe he was. But he wasn't because an evil spirit then did come into him. That wasn't his heart. He, he hadn't been changed. So the Spirit of God comes upon him. Notice what the Spirit of God shows him. Man, he's been KO'd. Okay, he's down for the count. And now God's showing him, oh, he's showing him what Israel is. Who the God of Israel truly is. Balaam, I want you to see me. I want you to see me, Balaam, who I am. You've been going to these enchanters. You've been going to all these other things. But look at who I am. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, the man whose eyes are open has said, he has said, which heard the words of God, which saw the visions, the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open, recalling back there when he was on the donkey. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are, they spread forth, as the gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lime aloes which the Lord has planted, and the cedar trees beside the waters. 
He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through his, with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down as a lion, as a great lion, who shall stir him up. Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. And he smote his hands together, and Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse my enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now, flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers which thou sentest unto me, saying, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own mind. But what the Lord saith, that will I speak. We know that's not true. He, he did speak what the Lord told him to speak. But that isn't really what his heart's been. That isn't really what he's wanted to do. It isn't. And now, verse 14, and now... Behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will advertise, or I will advise thee, what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. He didn't go to the place again where he'd been enchanting. He went to a different place. But God still found him because God is everywhere, and God still put a, a word in his heart. Showing him again after he's knocked him out. I want you to see who I am as God of Israel. But what does Balaam do here? What does he do here? He says, and I will, ad I will advertise or I'll advise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. The doctrine of Balaam. Go over in, uh, in Numbers here to, to chapter 31. And it gives us a little picture of some things that aren't said right there at this time. Chapter 31, verse 15, says, And Moses said unto them, Have you saved all the women alive? Now this is when they come into the land up in through there and they begin Midian and Moab are judged. And Moses said unto them, Have you saved all the women alive? Question mark. Behold, these, speaking of these women, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. That's what his last prophecy was from Peor. That's where he was prophesying from. That place. But what did he tell? What was the counsel of Balaam? to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. You know what, the, what was the counsel? What did Balaam counsel Balak to do? What, Shelley? Right, or vice versa, the women to marry the, the Moabite the Moabite women to marry the Moabite or the Israel men. Cross Mary. What did God say about that? Uh-uh. From the beginning of time, God has always, in, in our time, when we marry God, if we're Christians, God wants us to marry a Christian. God wants us to be equally yoked together. Always in Israel, he wanted them to be equally yoked together. He said, when you go into the land and you start taking over these enemies, do not intermarry with them. Why do you think when we get to the book of Ruth from Judges, Ruth was a Moabitess, and they were not to marry any of them. And, and how she feared when she came into Israel because of that. 
That was a fear because she wasn't supposed to marry. There was no hope of her marrying because she wasn't supposed to. But he counsels Balak. You know, if you want to, you know, I'm not going up to, I'm not going up to that high place anymore. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what you need to do to get Israel here. You have your ladies intermingle with the men or vice versa. And do you know what happens when that happens? We have the picture from Revelation 2.14. I'm going to go back there and read that because that was one of the ones that we started with. The doctrine of Balaam. Revelation 2.14 says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. We know today, chapters 2 and 3 of Revelations is for the church today like it was for then. There's some that can hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication with them. You are intermarrying and fornicating with the Moabite people, and I told you not to. That's exactly what Balaam encouraged to happen. See, he was a hireling prophet. And he wanted to sell or... Make a profit of his gift that he had. And, and not necessarily to get money, but to get the praise of those. Do you think Balak praised him for that in the end? You didn't curse. You didn't, in a sense, curse Israel. But in fact, you did curse Israel. Do you think Balak, for a time, was happy over that? I think he was. I think he was. We've got you. We've got you now. And it, one of the things, if the ladies came in to the man of Israel, this happened to Solomon. Once the man comes to the woman, here, where does she lead? False worship. She led the men of Israel into false worship. And what would they do in false worship? What were they doing in the high places? We made seven altars. We sacrificed there. But even look into what Israel did. The priests, when the sacrifices were made, they got a portion to eat, didn't they? So they were sacrificing at these altars, and they were giving the children of Israel the food that was offered to who? Idols. So that's how we get the two things with the doctrine of Balaam. He accomplished, in God's permissive will, just exactly what his will wanted to accomplish too, didn't he? We haven't looked at, I see what the time is here, the heir of Balaam. It won't take as long to go through the heir of Balaam, but I want to hit that just a little bit. Because we had the way of Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam. Really, the doctrine is that somebody comes in and mixes truth with error. This can make, this doctrine of Balaam, if you think about it for a minute here, can make the conscience feel good about sin or excuse it and allow it. Balaam's doctrine wants to come in here and make us feel good about defying the God of Israel, about going away from Him and make you feel good about it. See, if we're not quick and looking at Balaam here, what we've looked at, he looks like a good person kind of a little bit. There's some things that are, but if we take the, he was an evil man, and he never changed from being the man that he was there, even though God gave him choice, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, after he knocks him out, he still didn't come and believe. So what's the error of Balaam? That's what we read in Jude. From this morning and let me read it again since we haven't hit that tonight but just uh, Jude 11 says woe unto them for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after 
the error of Balaam for reward. The error of Balaam. The error of Balaam is this. For the sake of gain, these people corrupt the word of God and refine away its meaning. Corrupt the word of God and refine away the meaning. Maybe even make it sound a little better than it ought to sound. Refine away. So they ran greedily after. This ran greedily after is, it means to pour out all over. Pour out all over is what it means to run, ran greedily after. They poured out all over the air. The delusion. The delusion. The deception. The fraudulence. To make you think you are doing the right thing. To make you think you're doing the right thing all the time, moving you away from the truth. That's exactly what Balaam was doing. You can see it, can't you? It looked like he was doing what was right, but in the whole time, he was going to move Israel away from what God had intended for them to do. And he does it. He accomplishes. The apostate here to come in amongst us is very smooth. I used to use the word, a smooth operator. A smooth mover coming right in. Oh, they sound good. They look good. They answer all the right questions. But they're after bringing in the doctrine and the air of Balaam. We've seen it. We've seen it move in. We've seen it move in and grip our lives in different places that we've been. It's true today. It's happening and we've got to be aware of it. We've got to be discerning and be careful. Ran greedily after the heir of Balaam. Balaam means a false teacher for reward. That means that reward could be pay for services or it could be applause, fame, and popularity. What was Balaam after? He wasn't after, he wasn't after the gold and the silver and the high position in Balak's kingdom, but he was after the popularity, a popular prophet that people wanted to call in to bless or to curse. He wanted fame. He wanted fame. But how does it end for the apostate hireling prophet Balaam? We see it in Numbers 31. We've got to see his end. We've got to see his end. Because it goes right into what we've read in Jude where it says, Woe unto them! Woe unto them that go this way. Chapter 31 of Numbers and verse 8. It says, And they slew the kings of Midian when they come up in this area, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, and Recham, and Zur, and Hur, and Reba, five kings of Midian, Balaam also, the son of Beor. They slew with the sword. They slew with the sword. Balaam, the hireling prophet, the apostate, died. Was slain when Israel came into the land. Through the land. What was his fate? I believe from what we can see with scripture here, what it shows. His fate was everlasting punishment. Separation from the God of Israel. Even though God, God tried everything that he could. He showed him the pre-incarnate Christ. He showed him his directive will. He showed him his permissive will. He showed him the God of Israel. And he rejected the God of Israel. He had evil and wickedness in his heart. Oh God, I pray that none of us are apostates, which I don't think we are. I know, I know our group here well enough. But there are apostates that can come, and they will come. And we need to know what God's word says. 
And we need to be prepared to stand fast in the truth of God's word in the midst of it. Because God remembers. He promises us to preserve us. It's coming. It's going to happen. But I will preserve you as you hold on to me. And you're going to see my mercy and you're going to see my love. And it's going to be multiplied. Because we're faithful to him. And sometimes that's hard. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word again, Lord, as we look in the New Testament and in, in many places, Lord, as we look at Balaam and we look at the doctrine and, and, and the way and the air of Balaam, Lord, it speaks to us today. It's true today. And how we can go in 4,000, 6,000 years ago, Lord, and, and see probably 4,000, I think, in my mind, Lord, uh, to the things and the events that are happening right here in Numbers with Balaam and, and Israel coming into that land and the parts there, Lord. How it speaks to us. Lord, we see, a, we see a man here that was an apostate, a hireling prophet. You showed us him. Oh, Lord, let us evaluate our hearts and we pray that we aren't this prophet, that this isn't who we are in our heart but we've truly been converted and answered the call to salvation in our lives. Oh, I'm encouraged. That you, we think that it can be discouraging, but it's encouraging to me, Lord, to know that you promise to preserve us through it, to strengthen us through it, to allow us to persevere through it, Lord. And you give us the keys and how we're to act through it. Lord, help us to enter into those things and act like you would want us to in it. Always, Lord. Always standing for the truth of the word of God. And not deviating from it. Oh, Lord, as we've looked at this life of this man here. How it seems in our eyes as we look at him. Like there may have been something that he had with the Lord of Israel. That maybe he was a, a saved man. But that was the delusion. It looked that way. But it really wasn't. And Lord, for the first time over the last couple of weeks, you've really opened my eyes to understand this passage like I never could before. Thank you for that. I praise you for that. Lord, we ask that you watch over us tonight, throughout this next week, Lord. I thank you for the saints that are here and those that aren't here, Lord, be with them. And guide us, Lord, a couple things that we want to discuss here just before we, before we go tonight. Uh, we, we turn this all over to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.